Yep. So we do two separate yep. prizes? Yep, there's actually four in total. We'll start with two from Pedal Pack. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you and welcome back to the Die Hard Conference Ascoli people. Uh, it's good to see you at this fi uh, final session. My name's Matt Bauer and I'll be introducing our uh, speaker this afternoon. But before we do, we've got um, some exhibitor prizes to draw for everyone. So um, the first uh, prize is a notebook from uh, notebook as in a physical write-on, not a computer. <laughs> Sorry, didn't want to get your hopes up there. Um, from Pebble Pads, and the lucky winner is uh, Keelan and Sue. Either they're Siamese or they're just going things together. You're here? Great. Fantastic. Uh, please come down. Yep. And a round of applause. Yep. And the next one is... Uh, Matthew Ginnibert. Is Matthew here? Brilliant. Come on down, Matthew. <laughs> Round of applause. Okay. Echo 360. Things in it bag. Uh, things in it bag. <laughs> so that uh, goes to Daniel O'Hara. Is Daniel here? Okay, we're going to email post that to I him? I won't email it, but I'll post uh, it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no. so don't you have that technology yet? <laughs> and one more prize. I'm guessing from the Lambs team is a big mix-up. Hang on, not that one. That one is Linda Pannon. Is Linda here? Uh, we've heard that before, sir. We've heard that before, but okay. Come on. Okay. All right. Great. Congratulations. Okay. So um, for our final keynote at uh, the 2013 Ascalite Conference, uh, we're very privileged to have Mark Pesci to speak with us. Mark is an inventor, entrepreneur, writer, educator and broadcaster. In 1994 he uh, co-invented VRML, a 3D interface to the World Wide Web, and has gone on to write six books including The Playful World, How Technology is Transforming Our Imagination, uh, which explored the frontiers of the future through um, an examination of interactive toys and the next billion seconds, an analysis of culture now that we're all hyper-connected. Pesci founded uh, the postgraduate programs in interactive media at both the University of Southern California and the Australian Film, uh, Television and Radio School. For several years, uh, Mark was a panelist and judge on ABC's hit series, The New Inventors, and regularly comments on the intersection of technology and society for Triple J Hack, The Project, and ABC Local Radio. So, can everyone please welcome Mark Pesci. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? All right. Yay. So, it, it's really funny. I, I, I'm going to depart a little bit from my first comments because it was more or less, I did the math, 10 years ago today, on the corner of this campus used to be the Australian Film, Television, and Radio School. It's been taken over by Macquarie because we moved into the uh, entertainment quarter in Sydney. Uh, but it was about 10 years ago today that I actually was sat down in the managing director's office and offered a tertiary teaching post at the AFTRS to start the program in interactive media at a film school that was still really working in 35 millimeter. And my job there was to bring into the mix not so much the technologies of interactivity, but the understanding of what it would mean. And that was a big question for me, because I didn't really even know. And about the time that I actually got set up and got my desk and actually got scared because a huntsman the size of a dinner plate came out from behind the clock on the wall one day, and I'd never seen a spider that big. Being from America, we don't actually do spiders that big. <laughs> Settling in, and started using a new technology that had just come out called BitTorrent. BitTorrent was being used to distribute an animated film 
something that would be soon called machinima because it was made using Halo. It was the first machinima movie, something called Red vs. Blue, which was a series of three-minute vignette, comment vignettes, based on uh, Halo characters and Halo situations, mostly very, very funny. And the only way that you could get to it was by using BitTorrent. And I started using BitTorrent, and I realized as I started using BitTorrent that this was actually going to be even more interesting than a technology my students had introduced me to in America. When I was teaching at USC, my students said, hey, you should check out this new thing called Napster. It's really cool. And I started to understand from my experience first with Napster and then my experience with BitTorrent that, in fact, what was happening was technologies were changing our capability to share. They weren't changing our desire to share. That was innate. That's always been there. But the technologies were giving our capabilities, our desires, a scale that they never had. And that's really where I want to start this morning. Because that transition to a broad sharing culture is calling for us to start to rethink things. And one reason it is, is because sharing has become not just a social act, but a technologically supported act. And it's a technologically supported act because we are now living in a culture where over the 30 years since ASCII Light was founded, 30 years ago, computers were rare and they were expensive. At this point, everyone in the room probably has how many computers with them? Two to three? Four? Okay, so you're a bit of an outlier, but I'm sure, I'm sure if we sample the room, it wouldn't be that far off the map. So computing is no longer a thing over there. It's all around us, it's in everyone, it's all around the world. So we're embedded in the matrix of computing. And that has become the substrate for the way we learn now. And that's really what I want to talk about. Now, you get certain moments in your life, if, you, if you're on the lookout, where you get a snapshot of where everything is going. And I got one of those snapshots in August because at the last minute, I was invited to be a judge at the Young ICT Explorers event, which happened at Uni New South Wales in August. And it was 200 kids from all around New South Wales, grades four to grades 11, either singly or in groups with their own IT projects. And so very early on a Saturday morning, I got up and I met my fellow judges, my two fellow judges, and because it was so early, we decided to strike out across the UNSW campus in search of coffee. And as we got to chatting, and I was talking to them for a little while, I did a little math, and I realized that the sum of their ages came to my own. <laughs> and we were talking about the kinds of computing that they had had when they were in years four to six, because we were going to be judging the years four to six entries that morning. And the older one, who's now got a senior position at an international huge software company, he said, you know, when I was a kid, I remember these amazing 486s. They were wonderful, they were fast, they were powerful. Now the younger one, who was actually still a student at Uni New South Wales, is talking about the amazing, fast and powerful Pentium 3s that he had when he was 10 years old, and he started using computing in earnest. And I was staying very silent during all of this because when I was in year four, that was a small computer. It's a PDP-1145, filling an entire room. A Systems 360, an IBM mainframe, would fill the entire floor of a building. Now, I do remember my first CPU, the Z80, because it was practically the very first CPU. I was already 15 years old before microcomputing, as it was called back then, personal computing now, was available in pretty much any form whatsoever. And for the first 15 years of computing in this form, microcomputing, personal computing, computers weren't even connected. There were a few brave souls 
who bought modems, who dialed into time-sharing systems, logged into bulletin boards. How many of you did that? I'm sure there's a bunch of you in this room. Yeah, yeah, of course. But the, for the overwhelming majority of people who were using computers, the personal computer was a standalone object. And it is difficult for us from where we are now to understand how a device that was disconnected and maybe had a few tens of megabytes of storage was good for anything. Because if you think about it, what happens? These days, we shriek with impotent rage if we lose our mobile broadband signal for more than a few minutes. The idea of a computer has become synonymous with the idea that it is connected. So to have a computer is implicitly to have a device that's connected to billions of others, if not continuously, at least consistently. Now, around the time the older of my fellow judges started to use computers, so early 90s, the internet started to reach mainstream users. It was mostly filtered through various dial-up services. And it wasn't until a few years later, until the middle of the 1990s, that the World Wide Web exploded. And of course, that brought the internet to every corner of the planet. There's 18 years between the Z80 and the explosion of the web in 1995-ish. There's 18 years between the explosion of the web and the present. We mostly tend to dismiss or ignore those first 18 years because they weren't connected. Connectivity brought us one another, and it brought us one another in such large numbers that collaboration, sharing, became possible at scales that we couldn't actually conceive of before. Now, in January 2002, I was invited to an event at Oregon State University because it is the alma mater of the recently late lamented Douglas Engelbart. And this was a conference that was celebrating his life and his achievements. He was there. He was completely irascible the entire time. I had a slot and I spoke about his unfulfilled, at that time, unfulfilled promise for knowledge amplification. How could we use computers to increase human capability? I walked off stage and two other folks who were also speaking at the conference came up to me and said, Mark, have you heard of Wikipedia? And of course I hadn't, because this is January 2002. Wikipedia has 14,000 articles in it, which is less than an average children's encyclopedia. And I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting, whatever. But apparently there were a whole bunch of people who felt a lot differently. And what it lacked in content it made up for in enthusiasm and in potential. And what happened is that over the next three years, we saw Wikipedia explode and start to mature into something that seemed like a joke when you first heard it, which is the definitive English language resource for factual information. You know, seriously, if I'd said that in a room full of educators five years ago, the laughter wouldn't have stopped. But no one laughs anymore. The knowledge of hundreds of thousands of individuals had never been shared before. So we had no idea what was coming with Wikipedia. We couldn't conceive of a new kind of knowledge formation until it had landed it in our lap. We didn't have any precedent for what Wikipedia is and the other shared knowledge systems that have followed on in its footsteps. So the internet and the web provided the platform for sharing. And now we understand that we can connect and we can share and we can learn from one another. We're actually coming to understand that it's very hard to stop that from happening once people get connected together. Okay. Now that we got to this place in the middle 
of the last decade, what happened? Well, we actually needed a companion platform. We needed something that was going to take this collected, shared resource of human knowledge and make it ubiquitously and universally available. And what happens? What comes along? It's internet connected. It's web ready. It's equipped with rich interfaces for sharing. Wikipedia on the desktop is wonderful. Wikipedia in the palms of two billion smartphone connected individuals is a transformation in the human relation to knowledge. And of course, after the smartphone comes the tablet. Both the smartphone and the tablet, entirely new. Smartphones like the iPhone have been available in Australia for five and a half years. And amazingly, if you take a look at this, this now looks completely ancient to us because in five and a half years, what's happened? There's a combination of com competitive commercial pressures and pressures from the billions of people using these devices that have forced these devices to rapidly evolve into incredibly capable handheld computers, which a lot of you are using right now at this talk. So this world, this world of the smartphone and the tablet, this world of always on devices that are always connected to a huge and growing resource of shared human knowledge. That's the baseline for every student in the world right now. Every tertiary student, every secondary student, every primary student, every one of the students whose work I was going to be judging this day at UNSW. And this world is now changing the way those students think. It's having a direct impact on their expectations for how the world works and for their cap capabilities to work within that world. And it was brought home as I started to judge these projects. Now, Turns out that there were more projects submitted by the year four to six students than by any other division. And so the judges broke up into teams. There were 12 judges who were judging the uh, four to six year projects, teams of three. So our team of three sat down and we judged 10 of these projects. And the first project was an iBooks project. It was very pretty, not really outstanding, but very pretty. The second project was another iBooks project, very pretty, not really outstanding. I can't actually remember what the third project was. And then we got to the fourth table. There's two young girls there, ages nine and 10, and they're sitting and they hand us their tablet. And I go, ladies, what have you done? And they say, well, we've created a project we call Tech School. It's a, it's a tool that students can use to chat with one another and they can have group discussions and they can message teachers or other students with questions. <laughs> I actually went silent for 15 seconds and my other judges asked if I was all right because they could see something just sort of playing out over me because I was digesting the fact that these two children had wireframed and partially implemented a social sharing platform for the school, a social sharing platform similar to the one that I'd heard teachers asking administrators for over the last couple of years, uh, a platform that students could use rather than Facebook, which is what students use a lot of the time now because there's no other solution in place. A social sharing platform that they designed because as natives in a culture of shared knowledge, they intrinsically understood why they needed it. Now I'm going to cut to the chase and I will tell you, Annabelle and Angela took home first prize that day. They invented a solution to a problem that they and countless others experience in classrooms all across the world. And their thinking was pretty straightforward. If the classroom lacks the tools for sharing that they have everywhere in the outside world, why not just create them? And this was the moment that I recognized that educational computing is no longer a game that's owned by professional educators or educational designers or pretty much anyone else. It is now anyone's game. As soon as Wikipedia arrived, 
everything started to change. And this is now the mid middle point of this change, because children can now dream up and build educational technologies because their everyday environment provides countless examples that they can observe, that they can copy, that they can adapt, that they can permute, and then they can share. So computers aren't over there. And the cognitive processes that arise from the interactions with those computers, they're no longer distinct and separate. Now what we're seeing is that they're forming a continuity all of the rest of lived experience. We already know about and we've been talking about digital natives for a number of years. We're now well past that conversation. We're now in the era of sharing natives. This is a generation that has always understood that the value of connectivity lies in its capacity to amplify human effectiveness. And that's a lesson they never had to be taught explicitly because those children see their parents and their peers embracing connectivity as the carrier wave of capacity. And that's the way this new generation of students see the world. And to tie this together, it's why we need to think carefully and start to rethink everything about computing in learning. Because think, in seven years' time, they will be walking into tertiary education and their expectations and their demands and their capacities are now radically different. Our educational system, the one that everyone in this room was educated in, comes from a time when knowledge was rare and valuable. Comes from a time before sharing and connectivity. And the world doesn't work that way anymore. Neither do the children of that world. And of course, we've all gone hog wild for this. We've all embedded sharing into our practice, into our behaviors. We Facebook everything, we Twitter everything, we share everything that's important to us. And part of what that's starting to do is it's starting to highlight the artifice of formal education. In formal education, and this room is the embodiment of that, you have this idea that there's an educator who is dispensing bits and pieces of rationally thought argument to a student in digestible bits. The goal and the direction are being determined by the educator. And that system is still functional, but it is now encapsulated and operating within the new culture of shared knowledge. And really what I want to talk about is how we get those two to work together. We principally learn by imitation, by mimesis. And that's a process that is informal, and it's a process that's lateral. And by the way, I am a constructivist. If you're not a constructivist, that's fine, but I'm going to make a constructivist argument here. We absorb the learning of others. We absorb their opinions, both good and bad. Now, here's the thing. Mimesis, imitation had always been bounded by proximity. And because it had always been bounded by proximity, you would imitate the people that you were close to, you could always get a formal system in there to sort of interpose, to interrupt that. But global connectivity means that you can imitate anyone anywhere for any reason. I mean, I, I'll put this in one word for you, twerking. <laughs> we're learning from everyone everywhere. We're learning all the time. That's a behavior that is entirely natural. It is innate. It's probably genetic. And yet it is suddenly amplified beyond the capacity of any formal educational system to encapsulate it. And that's precisely why thinking about computers in learning becomes so fraught. Because the formal systems that we've evolved are no longer any match for the informal systems that have only recently popped up. Every single one of us is now carrying with us the collective, connected, and shared wisdom and stupidity of the race. Uh, let me give you a little look at what that looks like. So in July, 
I went into my local Target, Bondi Junction, and I picked that up. That is the $79 Penbo Pendo Pad. It isn't great. <laughs> I wouldn't expect greatness at $79. It's good enough. Right? It's good enough to connect to Wi-Fi. It's good enough to browse the internet. And that's really, in some sense, all that's required. It's an active connected service. Now, in September, I went online and I bought myself a Nexus 4, the Google phone. And it is beautiful, it is fast, it's responsive, it connects to mobile broadband and the Wi-Fi, it does everything, it's a really nice device. And Moore's Law specifies that the space between my $79 craptastic tablet and my wonderful Nexus 4 is at most 48 months. In other words, by July, August 2017, a $79 tablet is going to provide all of the capability that anyone anywhere is going to need to have a rich interactive connection to the shared store of human knowledge. And when that happens, everyone is going to have one. And as if to underscore that point, the largest educational ministry in the world, the Indian Ministry of Education, has begun selling subsidized tablets to their tertiary students. It's called the Akash tablet, $29. And it's got roughly the same capabilities of my $79 craptastic target tablet. And in four years' time, because they will continue to revise this, it will keep pace with Moore's Law, and it will be providing a rich, connected learning experience for every one of the millions of tertiary students in India who are being equipped with them. And that's a roundabout way for me to make one of my central points. Sharing, and the global culture of sharing, is not going to be restricted to rich Western countries with great infrastructure and high GDP. Sharing is a global problem. Pardon me, it's a global phenomenon. I think I was channeling the film industry there for a second. <laughs> Sharing is a global phenomenon, and in one essential aspect, it's really about the power of numbers, because when you have 10 or 20 million Indian students who are sharing what they know about calculus or economics or literature. You have a sharing capacity that's actually already orders of magnitude greater than that which created Wikipedia. And when you get a situation like that, that virtuous cycle of contributions and amendments, which are basically the engines for shared knowledge repositories, those kinds of systems start to appear almost instantaneously. Now, Jimmy Wales once told me that it took about five committed editors to get Wikipedia into a new language. And so think about this. As the Indian students start to get their subsidized tablets and those tablets start to get better, we're going to see not five committed editors, but probably something closer to five million, each of them creating domain-specific resources about every topic that they deem sufficiently important, just as in Australia, most of those topics will be concerning cricket. Now, that's actually important and significant to us here because a lot of that sharing is going to be in English because English is the lingua franca in India. And so it's going to be directly apprehensible by students in Australasia. And so in a striking bit of irony, where today what you have is you have Indian tertiary students coming to Australia for an education, tertiary students in Australia will be reaching out to resources created by tertiary students in India. And this is the environment that the educator is now going to be embedded in. Now, in a world where we've grown increasingly connected, peer mentoring becomes increasingly easy. And we're just about at a crossover point. When you get to sufficient scale, peer mentoring is almost always easier for a student to access than classroom time with a teacher. 
that's actually a good thing because educators are going to need the help that peer mentors are offering because it's going to leave educators with the time to deal with the hard problems, the problems that peer mentors can't answer. And this is one indication of the direction that the profession is heading in. Teaching is going to become more and more about educational problem solving. Where the native systems of knowledge sharing and peer mentoring fall down, that's where the professional educator steps in to bridge the gap. So the skills of a 21st century educator start to differ very markedly from the chalk and talk model of the classroom. Every day for that educator is going to be different. Every day is going to bring up its own set of problems. And so we're going to leave the follow the dots mode of curriculum teaching behind. And the educators who will be the most successful in the 21st century are the ones who are the most innovative, resourceful, and collaborative. Because students aren't alone in working in an environment of peer mentoring. Educators are embedded in their own peer mentor networks. And those networks are evolving into capacity amplifiers. They allow educators to bring the best of others in play to solve the continuous away array of problems that students are bringing to them. So students learn from shared resources and they learn from one another. Educators help students work through the difficulties that are beyond the expertise of those networks. And to do that, the educators draw upon their own networks of expertise. And so sharing amplifies the capacities of all of the stakeholders in the educational process, formal and informal. Now, one of the questions that get raised often at this point in any discussion of collaborative knowledge, collaborative learning, is assessment. How does assessment work? Assessment is currently performed by separating the student from the resources that would aid them in the assessment. So how does assessment work in a world of peer mentoring and shared knowledge? And we've been stuck on the horns of this dilemma for a few years. It hasn't yielded a ready answer, but I think I understand why. I think it's because the question itself in this context doesn't make any sense. One thing I hope you can take home from this talk today is that in a pervasive sharing culture, the culture that we're entering into now, assessment is intrinsic to the act of sharing. You cannot share unless you have some level of expertise. You consider that we recommend, regularly recommend, that students create or edit or improve Wikipedia articles because that helps them extend their knowledge. You can't, you can't contribute until you have some knowledge to contribute. And you don't truly understand a subject until you're qualified to teach it. And that basic observation dispels the assessment dilemma. Students must not simply absorb and regurgitate shared knowledge resources. They have to be able to teach them. They have to pass along what they've learned through peer mentoring into their networks, formally and informally. Every moment of peer mentoring is an act of assessment. And there will be so many of these, it will become a straightforward affair to continuously monitor a student's competency in subject material. Now for that to work, students are going to have to be able to rate the performance of their peer mentors. That's always going to be a little bit fraught. It's going to be easier with tertiary students than it will be with, pri or with secondary students. The ability to critique the mentoring of peers and the ability to receive that critique and to act upon it, this is one of the core competencies that has to be incorporated in any curriculum that works with shared knowledge resources. Now, as soon as students work in shared knowledge environments, they have to learn how to assess their peer mentors 
and they're simultaneously having to learn how to deliver the mentoring in a way that's satisfying those that they're teaching. Okay, with so much reliance on peer mentoring and peer mentoring-based assessment, there is a possibility that a student can lose their way. They can get stuck on a problem and they can be unaware of where to turn for help. And a peer mentor might be aware of that situation but it requires someone with authority to come in and solve it. So the problem solving that is the professional educator's role in an educational system that's built out of a culture of shared knowledge, their role extends to monitoring students and monitoring them to the degree that they're constantly keeping them on track. The professional educator is tracking student progress. Professional educators intervening as required to keep those students on track toward the students' goals. So this is the 30th ASCII light. Is that right? I'm reading that correctly, which is amazing. Congratulations. 30 years ago, you folks got together to explore how computers could improve tertiary education, which is a big thing, particularly given what computers were like 30 years ago. So 30 years is a billion seconds. It's the billion seconds that define a generation. And we've seen computers move from rarity to ubiquity. And for that reason, every interaction with a computer is now potentially a teaching moment. Now, the internet existed 30 years ago, but at that point, it was the domain of a few research universities and large defense contractors, almost all of whom were located in the United States. A billion seconds later, and the billions of computers that are out there are largely defined by their connection to a global internet. The teaching moment of ubiquitous connected computers includes every computer everywhere and every one of the five billion plus connected individuals. And that's the shape of the 21st century. That's the culture within which tertiary institutions and indeed all institutions are now situated. Technology is no longer the question. We have plenty of it. We'll be getting more. Innovators, probably a lot of you, will continue to develop new tools that will make computing increasingly more useful to educators. There's no real question about that either. But this is still a moment of crisis, uh, a moment of existential questions. And although that existential crisis has been initiated by technology, it doesn't provide a way out. The crisis can only be answered by a change in practice. Everything is connected. And there, and I don't mean that philosophically, I mean that in a very practical sense. Therefore, everything about our practice has to start to reflect that fundamental condition. Everything that was discrete in the educational process needs to become continuous. Everything that was separate needs to start to function as a coherent unity. We need to begin building networks. And I don't mean the networks of copper if you're Malcolm Turnbull or fiber if you're Stephen Conroy or radio waves. I mean the ephemeral webs of relationships that are the active manifestation of our capacity. And those networks need to begin. They need to be seeded even before the student enters a tertiary institution. Those students have interests, they have career plans, 
they need to be able to connect to the institutions and the professional organizations that will ferry them along the path toward the career goals or toward the personal goals. And the connections I'm talking about are more than just links to a website or some LinkedIn-style static CV that you get headhunted from. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that feels a lot more like Stack Overflow. Now, how many of you know what Stack Overflow is? So Stack Overflow is, for those of you who don't know, it's essentially a question and answer website for people who work in programming. And so you can ask a question, and someone will come along and answer it. And it's slightly gamified in the fact that you get points for asking a good question, and you get points for giving a good answer, and the community rates your answers and rates your questions and so on. And quite often, if you type any particular question for a problem that you're having into Google, there is already an answer in Stack Overflow, and you can just go and read the answer. And it's pretty easy to find out who the experts are in any particular problem domain because all you need to do is look at the leaderboard and figure out who's got the most points. That's who the community considers expert in this area. Now, a website like Stack Overflow can be an incredible resource because what happens? They connect learners to experts. They connect peers to professionals. They make it easy to find those people that you want to learn from. Now, while a student is pursuing their degree or qualification, every course, every course offered by a tertiary institution must come paired with the implicit promise that it will build out the student's network of expertise in that area. A course is not a one-shot moment of learning. It's an opening to a process of understanding, and it's an invitation into a community of expertise. And that is the classroom that has been reframed by universal connectivity. It's a classroom that acknowledges that there's more beyond the classroom walls than could be dreamt of in philosophy. The classroom is where students go to deepen their connections to their peers, to their mentors, to the educators, to the subject material. And tertiary institutions who make the most of this insight will be the ones that will prosper in the middle years of the 21st century. Now it's funny because last week we started to see the collapse of the first of the MOOCs, Udacity. Got a lot of money in Silicon Valley. They're reframing it as a pivot, which is Silicon Valley PR speak for, while that didn't work, we're going to try this. What it really means is that we now know that getting 100,000 students online taking the same online course won't achieve good outcomes unless a huge amount of work has been put into building the support network that those students need as they work their way through the subject material. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So, what happened was basically Udacity took the chalk and talk model and amplified it and amplified it and amplified it beyond usability. And it collapsed because human connectivity does not scale the same way computer connectivity does. Computers can very easily be promiscuous. People are much more selective. They invest themselves in their networks and in their relationships. And that takes time and money and expertise, none of which Udacity wanted to invest in. Now, the tertiary institution has the capacity to offer scale. But it can do it with the support that comes from institutional expertise. It won't be as inexpensive 
because support requires human beings. It requires infrastructure. All of these have costs. But it also won't feel cheap. So students entering the networks of connected tertiary institutions will feel their capacities grow in lockstep with their connectivity. And that's the key difference between a tertiary institution in the 21st century and some here today, gone tomorrow, educational online provider. Now, tertiary institutions have always had informal networks. And that's the reason so many Australian students try to get into the eight sandstones, or in America, the seven Ivy Leagues because the broader culture implicitly acknowledges the values of the networks the students build as they pass through the schools. For example, America's presidents tend to be educated at Yale and Harvard. The current prime minister graduated from Sydney. The previous prime minister graduated from Melbourne. The informal networks of elite universities are invitations to power and to influence. So everything that's been informal, everything that's been barely acknowledged about those networks of influence now needs to be formalized. Schools will be judged on the quality of the networks that students have integrated themselves into at the time they graduate. Now, it's never really been what you know, but who? But the thing is, is that now, who you know maps directly onto what you know. Capability flows in lockstep from connectivity. And any school that understands that, any school that acts on that, transforming its practice so that it aligns with the pervasively connected culture of sharing that's being delivered by ubiquitous computing, will be providing the best possible foundation for its students to excel. Now much of what's needed to make this happen already exists. Either it exists informally or it exists in a bunch of disconnected elements. And the next few years is going to see all of these pieces stitched into coherent holes as we learn how to build networks that we use to build networks. Now, I want to close with one final point. Students aren't the only ones getting the full benefit of these networks of expertise. We are all situated in the global culture of shared knowledge. We're all connected. And professional educators must build out their networks of expertise just as they help students build theirs. Building these networks is necessary for two reasons. First off, we can't expect students to learn from us how to build those networks unless we are expert in doing it ourselves. And second, and actually more significantly, the transformation of tertiary education is a group project. We need to be learning from one another. We need to be copying best practices and avoiding mistakes as we move into this new era of connected education. No one need do this alone. I'm not actually sure that anyone could do this alone. Now, because we're moving together, we're moving more rapidly and we're moving with more intelligence than we ever have before. Rethinking our relation to learning begins with an act of recognition. And that recognition is that the hard yards are actually already behind us. We are almost there. Really, we only need to activate and formalize the networks that have always been at the heart of learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that stimulating and provocative talk. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions, and we do have a bit of time. So um, does anyone have any questions for Mark? Yes, yes. 
Yes. Um, we've gone in the last 15 years from a culture where we were essentially disconnected all of the time to now a culture where we're essentially connected all of the time. And we've, it's sort of been a binary operation. We've gone from zero to one. And we haven't really got a sense for the fact that there's value in this disconnected time because we just sort of abandoned it. But most creativity actually happens in, you wouldn't quite call it isolation, but in quiet, in undisturbed time. And it is difficult to map out what the balance point is, because we're all quite new at this, between maintaining disconnection and connected time. It's particularly difficult for someone who's 16 or 17 years old and has never really known any culture but the connected culture. They find disconnected culture quite alien. And so the capacity that we think of as being a positive benefit associated with disconnection is not something that they're at all familiar with. There needs to be a concerted effort to present examples in the culture of why thoughtfulness through disconnection is valuable. We don't really have those yet. And so the question is, in another 15 years, whether that's simply going to be an artifact that's thought of as people sitting in the dark before there was electricity, or whether this is actually something that people are going to want to work out toward. Now, I have friends in America who started something called, they call the Technology Sabbath, which is like the Jewish Sabbath. On Friday night, the devices get turned off and they stay in the drawer until Saturday night. And they play with the kids and they do whatever they want, but they're just disconnected. And so that's their adaptation to this. And the idea, particularly in the Bay Area, which they are, is gaining a bit of currency, but it's also waging war against a much larger civilizational process. You know, you can say this to someone in the Bay Area, but if you're talking to someone in India who's actually using that device to trade and has actually substantially increased their income because they can always get a phone call or a text, their relationship to connectivity is a completely different thing. And so there probably isn't a one-size-fits-all answer to it. What we do need to think about, particularly in the context of education, is how students can create the space for them to be able to think and to study in a world that would tend to disrupt them. Yes. So what kind of, what kind of possible ways do you see that we can be building these networks? The networks already exist. I don't think that the, I don't think we need to build them. I think what we need to do is to integrate them because in every profession, there are professional associations, professional societies, there are people who are gathering around something. So essentially what the educator is doing is the educator is then situated within the network of experts within their particular domains of expertise. And there's going to be multiples of them because we're, we are a multiplicity. And so what the educator does as part of the education process is open the students up into those networks of mentorship. All right, so in other words, it's not a binary operation. It's simply taking the things that we're already having that are f informal and making them slightly more formal and making them part of what happens, quote unquote, in the classroom. So we're thinking this on a topic level and not on an institutional level. Uh, I'm not thinking, I think it's true on both levels. It's actually true on all levels. Students also enter in with their own networks. All right. Some of those will be informal friendship networks, but some of them will also be either career or topically oriented networks. And so there's the, it's networks all the way down, I guess is probably the way to think of it. So when you're talking about a particular domain, then you could have a very specific set of networks. Institutional networks are also important as well. All right. And those are, have always been largely informal. You know, they're more formal now because there's